There were five major demagogues in ancient Greece and Rome, and they were all dangerous. Uh, you can a, a demagogue is somebody who whips up the populace, and uh, we we talked today about populists and populism. This is really a modern version of demagogy. So if you go back to 422 BC when Cleon died, he was an influential Athenian politician during the Peloponnesian War, which is when demagogy emerged. And uh, he used aggressive and violent rhetoric. He, 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 he wanted harsh measures against Athens' enemies, uh, and anybody who questioned policies, internal um, dissenters, he was instrumental in the execution of the Mytilian citizens following a revolt against Athens. And his policies and his demagogy contributed the, to the deepening of political divisions in Athens. And um, fresh on his heels, really, um, was Alcibiades. And he was... Um, a, a, a an, an extraordinary man, a, a, a turncoat, um, and uh, he. Uh, I, I think Alcibiades actually probably was slightly before Cleon, um, but he was he was charismatic in a way that, that, that eclipsed even Cleon. Um, he was a friend of Socrates. Socrates. He, he appears in the Symposium. He is. He, he he has this magnetic personality, and he he manipulated public opinion to support his ambition. Uh, for example, with the disastrous Sicilian expedition, his shifting allegiances between Athens and Sparta and Persia um, showcased his opportunism uh, in in a way that I suppose is paralleled by Johnson's two. Uh, versions of the article about Brexit. Um, his actions, Alcibiades' actions, directly contributed to the instability and the eventual downfall of Athens. His pursuit of personal power uh, came at the expense of the city's well-being. And then you come to ancient Rome and the, the, the big demagogues there, Gracchus, uh, m most of us probably know Gracchus really from <laughs> from uh, what was name Spartacus the film, but Gracchus was a Roman politician who, along with his brother Tiberius, attempted significant social and economic reforms. So from that point, he was a positive. His actions pushed for land reform, subsidized grain, um, and uh, and measures to help the lower classes, the plebs. Um, but uh, he, he appealed directly to them, bypassing the Senate's authority and seriously damaging the um, uh, mechanics of power. Uh, if, if his intentions may have been noble, his methods and the resulting political conflict led to violent confrontations and his eventual death. And the Gracchi brothers... Uh, efforts highlighted the dangers of populism, demagogy, in creating deep divisions in society, setting precedents for bypassing traditional structures. Uh, without, without um, Gracchus, I, um, I, I don't think you would have got Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar is also a product of Marius and of uh, Sulla, but but all of them are are breaking down the structures of society. Uh, uh, Lucius Sergius uh, Catalina, uh, the Cataline conspiracy uh, thing. The uh, Catalin was was a Roman senator, notorious for his attempt to overthrow the principles of the Roman Republic. He led this Cataline conspiracy, um, aiming to to use uh, populist demagogic rhetoric and promises of debt release to gain support for his coup and the conspiracy's failure largely due to the efforts of Cicero underscored the threat that popularism 
poses to society, and in this case to the Republic. His actions were a stark reminder of how easily this appeal to the basis, the basic instincts um, generate civil strife and undermine stability. And then you get Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar, this military general, this statesman uh, who played um, a critical role in um, in the events leading up to the collapse of the Roman Republic. And if he was not Caesar, if he was not the emperor, he was all in, all, all, all but, and uh, I was going to say he was all in, he was all uh, uh, but, but in name, but no, the name of the emperors was his. He was the prototype. Even if he rejected the crown itself. He used his popularity with the masses, driven by military successes and public works, to accumulate unprecedented power and money and his crossing of the Rubicon River. Such a tiny little stream in 49 BC symbolised his willingness to defy the Senate and the traditional Republican norms. And, 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 and he wasn't the first to have crossed the Rubicon. Sulla did it before him. But it's Caesar that we remember. His actions, his eventual dictatorship, paved the way for the end of peace, for the end of the Roman Republic, for the rise of the empire. And his assassination on the Ides of March uh, hi highlights the fears and the resistance um, that, uh, that, that the system had to his populism. Um, and uh, the the anxiety about the way that he ha he he might destabilize the entire political system, but it had gone too far by that stage. Uh, the the lack of stability was already there. And then you come to today, and the 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 the, the problem of populism in British politics, and it's become a significant feature with people like Nigel Farage. Boris Johnson, and I would add Liz Truss. Um, it, it typically involves appealing to the general population by contrasting the interests of ordinary people against those of the elite, by, by claiming the elite or the system is wrong and that you have a better idea. And this trend has introduced both opportunities and challenges to... Um, the, the, the system to authority, to uh, security and stability. Uh, f f first with Farage, um, who arose through the th through UKIP and then later the Brexit Party and now Reform UK. Uh, he's been a key figure in promoting the, uh, the, the, the desertion from Europe and his his rhetoric has focused on sovereignty, immigration control, anti-establishment sentiment, significantly shaping public opinion, public discourse about the things that are wrong. But the Farage trick is to focus on what is wrong, not on what can be put right. It's about negativity, not about positivity. It's about destruction, not creation. Boris Johnson. His tenure as Prime Minister was marked by a similar populist appeal and his promise to get Brexit done uh, resonated with voters frustrated with the prolonged Brexit process conducted by twits like Theresa May. His charismatic and often controversial um, personality, his style, cemented his populist credentials and then you've got Liz Truss. Liz Truss, who was less overtly populist, uh, she was simply destructive. Which is the tools. So she was, she, she, she was, she had all the tools of populism, but none of the appeal. I, she couldn't, she couldn't appeal to a tomato. Uh, she just waved her hands about and used the same tropes as the populists. Talking about economic freedom, talking about reducing government intervention, which resonates with populist sentiments about limiting the elite control over the economy. 
Now, Alistair Campbell was discussing some of this last night on Channel 4 and the potential for increased pressure because of Farage and because of th this appeal to populism uh, to change UK's electoral system. Uh, and th this will be because the, the vote share, though distributed across the whole country, for reform is likely to be significant. The vote share for the Lib Dems is likely not to be significantly different but they're likely to have significantly more MPs because of their targeting seats that are going to be lost by the Conservatives. So it's likely not to be the Lib Dems, it's likely not to be the Labour Party, it's likely to be this impetus from Farage and the sheer weight of statistics which forces the first past the post, the FPTP, if you want the acronym, uh, to collapse. And I think it will collapse very quickly. Alistair Campbell is absolutely right. Under the current system, candidates who receive the most votes in their constituencies win, often leading to disproportionate representation in Parliament. Some smaller parties with significant national support struggle to win seats in Britain. And proportional representation would be a way to allocate seats more closely to the percentage of votes each party receives nationally, therefore offering a fairer um, slice of the cake to, um, uh, to, to, to uh, pick up one of Liz Truss's metaphors. Farage has already started campaigning for PR. Um, and he's... He, he's, he's, already, he's, he's already putting forward the idea and the shift towards that uh, stems from his recognition that PR would allow his and similar parties to gain seats um, that would reflect their national support, which is difficult under the first-past-the-post system. Uh, historically, the Lib Dems have been the primary um, organ advocates for PR, arguing that they would better reflect the electorate's diversity. Um, and Campbell's point about the irony um, is that Farage, traditionally benefiting from the current system, now potentially becomes a major advocate for PR. Uh, meanwhile, the Lib Dems might ironically benefit, as I say, from the first-past-the-post system in the next election, increasing their number of MPs without a corresponding increase in their national vote share. Now, the broader implications of all this are that there will be pressure on major parties, like uh, not only the Labour Party and the Conservative Party, but also the SNP. And uh, this is going to... The, the, if, if proportional representation comes in across the UK, it will shake up the system. We may no longer... We, we may never again see a single party um, in government. It may always be a co coalition, and that may be better. The coalition between the Lib Dems and the Conservatives, though it didn't do the Lib Dems reputation any good was a very stable period and that shift could drastically change our political landscape our expectations it could make it more inclusive not only for smaller parties but for uh, the uh, particular whims and ideas of the larger parties, it, it may well see the fracturing of the larger parties, because at the moment those larger parties are held together because of a fear that if you abandon those two, those two big parties, the Labour and Conservative, you will never have power. And without power, it's just somebody bashing a gong in the background. Farage. Um, and uh, the Lib Dems... Uh, strategic position over the last 50 years has never changed any of this though I remember in the 1970s having discussions in chemistry class about um, proportional representation but it's going to be Farage who will bring this in who will force this issue whether he remains independent of the conservatives or aligns himself with the conservatives or indeed joins the conservatives he will be the one putting forward this idea and probably it will be part of his um, of the terms of his um, link with whichever party he chooses to link to. I think the idea that he won't be elected in the next 
in, in the next election on uh, July the 4th is madness. He is the most brilliant performer, sort of on a double-decker with a cigar hanging out of his fingers. Um, I mean, it's it's breathtakingly louche and loud and languid and um and it's it captures an image in a way that modern politicians are are, are not memorable so desperate are the um policy makers in the labor party and the conservative party not to not to rock the boat not to shock people with personality leave your personality at the door that individual politicians with the mild exception of, of uh, Rhys Mogg, are sidelined, um, are, are, are not encouraged to be interesting. They're encouraged to be dull and grey and simply to recite slogans. Uh, you know, the, the irony of Farage championing PR, which is traditionally the Lib Dem position uh, exemplifies the evolving and the contradictory nature of modern politics of modern political strategy the fragmentation the breaking of the system this is demagogy this is we've seen all this before really haven't we i mean in, in history this is the stuff of the collapse of the roman republic